Thanks for coming to my panel. My name is Edward Bastos. Uh, it's my panel uh, on uh, intro to music production recording. Uh, I left this slide and I shouldn't have. This was the original name of my panel, but corporate made me change it. There's no such thing as corporate. I, I just... <laughs> so who am I, uh, and why should you care what I have to say about music production? Uh, well, I'm, my name is Edward Bastos. Uh, first and foremost, I'm famous for being for being a staff member across the way at the Jam Clinic, come over and check us out, it's a lot of fun. Uh, you may also know me as a software developer. That's my day job, not musician, right? So, uh, so that's pretty cool. Uh, I, I work, uh, I do Android apps uh, pretty much as far as you can get for music, other than the fact that I work on a music app that statistically speaking you probably have installed on your phone. Uh, you can find me on, uh, and these are some uh, SoundCloud links that are not live because I'm not going to give you these slides because I don't know how to do that. Um, but uh, I'm sick with beta music on SoundCloud. Uh, I've put up some uh, music that I've made myself um, and or with collaborations with others uh, up there. Uh, I also am in a band called Full Combo VGM. Uh, and if you were here for the sound test a little while ago, that's actually one of our uh, 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 covers. Uh, we do video game, both myself and my band, we do video game music covers, which is pretty on brand for MacFest, I think. Um, so you can definitely check check me out on there, uh, but um, we're not like we're not like super famous. Like we 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 have three songs. Like we just got started, right? Um, and so the whole point of the slide, and as you can probably tell by my super professional headshot, is I'm just some guy, right? And the the, the point of this panel is that you too can be just someone guy, <laughs> um, right? Like like there's a serious point there, which is like you know a lot of people think like oh I want to do music, but I do how, right? It's not that hard. Uh, it, pretty much the short version of this panel is you just start and you do what you can and you keep iterating and you keep learning new skills and you keep learning that stuff on there, right? Um, so what are we gonna talk about today? Uh, first of all, I'm gonna give you uh, uh, some suggestions of software you should get, uh, some hardware that you should get. Really, uh, hardware that you need to get in order to get started, but uh, I'm gonna make some recommendations. Uh, we're gonna do a live demo in which I'm actually going to create the software. Um, don't worry, like any good cooking show, I'll have a finished cake to pull out so that we can you know, avoid time constraints. Um, I'm gonna share some pro tips uh, that will be relevant for you if you are uh, just one person who's uh, trying to do recording. Perhaps you're trying to be like a session musician for other, uh, other producers, right? You wanna be like the guy who plays saxophone on everywhere that's a song. Uh, if you look at my single beta music page, that's usually what I do. Uh, I'm on a bunch of material collective tracks that is doing that. So I have a couple of kind of uh, pro tips I can share about like workflows for that. Um, and the same thing if you're on the other end of that, uh, that coin, other side of that coin, where you're the person doing the production, uh, and maybe you've got other people working with you, maybe not, maybe you're uh, just a one person gig, right? Uh, but those are kind of two di different, uh, really different approaches to music uh, production. That's why this panel is called recording and production, right? Because there's all, uh, you, you, you kind of need to know a little bit of, of each to do either one, right? Like you, even if you just want to be the session musician, you still need to know a little bit about how to produce. Um, otherwise, you're going to create a lot of work for other people. So we're going to talk about all that. Uh, and then I, I hope to have some time for a QA at the end. Uh, they gave me a one and a half hour block in rehearsal. It took all one and a half hours. Um, so I'm going to really do my best to squeeze it into an hour. Uh, for that reason, I'm going to have a pretty uh, steadfastly ask that you guys hold your questions till the end, because uh, I love to talk, in case you haven't realized that I'm two slides in after like five minutes, uh, and like the slightest off topics will get me to three hours. So uh, let's, let's get going. Uh, so software that you need, right? Um, the first thing, the most important thing, you're going to need a digital audio workstation. And I'm going to say that you're going to need Reaper. Right, like most people who give uh, conversations like have conversations like this will say, oh, it depends on your needs. Yeah, it does depend on your needs, right? I'm gonna tell you what you need is Reaper, right? If you're, <laughs> if you're here and you feel and you're here, you probably because you feel like you're a little bit overwhelmed with the prospect, Reaper is for you. Most DAWs, uh, which is what people shorten that to, uh, most DAWs are fairly expensive, like hundreds, thousands of dollars, depending on the one. Um, Reaper is not. Reaper is free for evaluation purposes, and uh, uh, a, a entry level license costs sixty dollars. Now, some people will tell you Reaper is free. Period. They're wrong. If the second that you put out a song, 
please pay them for it. It's an incredible product. It goes toe to toe with the thousand dollar products. They deserve your sixty dollars, right? Um, but it's a re really good product. I'm gonna, uh, and it's what I'm gonna be using for this presentation. Um, so I'm gonna try to keep things as general as possible and not say like this is how you do things in Reverb, right? But that's also what I'm gonna do because I don't have Pro Tools. Um, engraving software. This may be optional. This is more important if you're working with other people. Engraving is basically the technical term for creating sheet music for people. So if you're um, just a one person gig, one person gig, that's pretty cool. Um, <laughs> then you don't really need this, but the second that other people are involved, depending on the person that, that is involved and their skill set, maybe you can get away without it, but having the ability to uh, create sheet music for them is gonna save you so much time. Uh, oh, so yeah, MuseScore, it's free. Uh, that's pretty, pretty much it, right? Like, I actually highly prefer Sibelius, and Sibelius has a tier now where you can pay them $5 a month and use it, and Sibelius is, Awesome, it's so much better than the score, full stop. That being said, you might not actually use it enough that even the $5 a month is justified, and new score does most of what you'll need. So it's good enough, and it's what I'm recommending. Uh, we're not gonna really go into new score today, because this is not an intro to engraving, it's a retirement point of right? Definitely something you'll need uh, to consider. Um, VSTs, so uh, this is a term I'm gonna hear a lot, um, and VST is kind of not that great of a term. I don't know what it stands for, um, but what it means um, is VST is a standard, right? It's, a, it's, it's like a language that software can use to communicate with each other. And for that reason, there are many different types of software that we call VSTs. Generally speaking, the two major categories are virtual instruments and, uh, and effects plugins, right? So. Uh, a virtual instrument is something where you can provide it MIDI data um, and it will produce sound waves for you. So you can say C4, D4, E4, and the rest of whatever the lick is, um, and it will produce you the sound waves that sound like da -da 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 -da, played by a piano, for example, right? Um, and so what you, um, that's what a, 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 virtual, a VST instrument is that. An effects plugin, think of it like when you plug in a guitar to an amp, you'll get a louder sounding guitar. But if you plug in your guitar into a, uh, an overdrive pedal and then into an amp, you'll get that sound louder, but also modified. Uh, FX plugins will do that, but at a software level. So like, uh, and, and actually, they're, you know, that metaphor is really good because you can just get a guitar effects PST, right? Um, I recommend uh, uh, that you just get something that gets you a bunch of VSTs to work with, with instruments and plugins, um, because as you probably can guess, min-maxing off of like, which saxophone VST should I use for every single instrument gets old very quickly, right? So I'm gonna recommend you get Contact Complete, and I don't know off the top of my head how much that costs. I think you, because there's like different tiers, but I think there's Contact Complete, and then somehow that's not everything. Uh, there's Contact Complete Ultimate, which is <laughs> more, um, and I think the pricing is $500 and $800, but I'm not sure. It's a lot of money. Um, and pro tip, when you're buying music, especially music software, uh, but music stuff in general, but mostly software, um, Black Friday sales and uh, summer sales are incredible. So when I bought Contact Complete and then later upgraded to Contact Complete Ultimate, um, they actually discounted that 50% on each of them. So I think altogether I ended up paying $400. Um, so when you're buying music stuff, definitely look for those type of deals. Um, if you have to pay full price for something, do it. Really try not to pirate stuff. Not the Reaper thing about paying for Reaper. That's uh, that's like my viewpoint of like like my political viewpoint of like you should pay for stuff, right? The VST thing. That's not where I'm coming from. Where it, when it comes to you should pay for stuff. You should pay for VSTs because it's going to make your life easier. Like if you try to pirate stuff, it's just, they have really annoying ways of making sure you do that. So just do it, right? Um, so hardware. Um, this is uh, a lot less optional because you're, you're, you're going to need all this stuff to actually do anything. So first off, you're going to need either uh, a Mac or a PC, right? Um, most people, a lot of people will tell you, get a Mac, right? Um, Macs don't crash. They do. Um, and so do Windows computers. Uh, so you don't need to buy a Mac, which is good because Macs cost $2,300. Um, I have a PC. It works great for music production. 
it also costs you $2,300, right? So what your specific needs are, are gonna dictate what type of computer you need. Again, if you're just, you know, doing guitar solos and shipping them off to somebody, that doesn't need a, 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 like a supercomputer, right? But if you're gonna be uh, running a band with like, a big band with like 40 players or something like that, um, probably gonna need some more RAM, probably gonna need uh, a CPU, not so much, definitely RAM. Um, and depending on how many VSTs are running at any given time, um, that'll increase your RAM requirement or requirements. But also, especially for virtual instruments, you'll probably need, need a lot of storage space. Um, I have a VST called Superior Drummer, which, um, as it turns out, is a very good way of making drum soap sounds. So I guess that's where they came up with the name. That's 300 gigabytes. Um, this laptop comes with 512 gigabytes. So that's the operating system, Reaper, any other VSTs, um, Overwatch, and somehow I've got a fit in a drum VST in there. It's not gonna happen. So when, <laughs> when I started using Superior Drummer, that pretty much meant that I had to plug in an external hard drive in order to get that done. So I'm actually not even gonna be using Superior Drummer for this demo because it, where's my hard drive, right? I, I'm not getting that on a plane. Uh, so that's the first thing. You'll need an audio interface. Um, this, uh, if you look at my table right here, which hopefully it shows up on the video, it's this red box right here. Um, uh, what I have is called the Focusrite Scarlet 2i2, uh, so-called because it has two inputs and two outputs, um, which is kind of not true, right? Like right here, I've actually got one, two inputs and then like the one stereo output, uh, which is going to the mains in the computer. Um, and that's what it's producing the sound from the computer. The reason you need this is because this is how you actually get sound waves from a microphone, um, or if you have a MIDI controller, um, all that stuff goes to a MIDI interface. Um, and that's how it will get into your uh, computer and eventually to your hard drive. Um, this is pretty much the, uh, the Focusrite Scala is pretty much the closest thing to a standard get this when you're starting out audio interface that there is. It's super reliable, has great specs, um, you can't go wrong with it. It's super easy to figure out too. Like the, a lot of audio interfaces will have really complicated dials and stuff on them. And like I said, two inputs, two outputs, you can get an audio interface that has like 16 inputs for your whole band. Um, that's something you might want to consider scaling up to. Um, maybe just start off with the $160 one to get started. Um, so next, you're going to need a microphone if you're recording saxophone or any other acoustic instrument, right? Uh, if you're recording guitar, you can wire straight, you know, straight into it. You can do your, all your effects files, go straight into the interface. If you're doing a, a, a microphone, uh, you're gonna uh, need uh, a microphone that supports XLR. Um, so a lot of times you go on, on Amazon, you can just type in like microphone. The first thing that's gonna come up is probably gonna be a Yeti, the little ball shape thing. And it's gonna be over USB. You can use a USB microphone if you want. Um, you just plug it straight into your laptop and you will understand it. And there's not really gonna be significant performance difference, right? Um, like, as far as microphones go, um, a lot of people will tell you like, oh, you need to get like a $600 microphone. And yeah, it's true, $600 microphone's probably gonna be better than a $100 one, uh, but not in ways that you'll notice within a month of this one, right? To definitely get like a, a, a standard issue, like starter microphone, for me, that was the Audio Technica AT2020. Um, again, really reliable, just dead simple microphone. You plug it in, you stand within a 45 degree angle in front of it, and you play, right? Um, every microphone has its own characteristics, both in terms of like where you can stand and it will still hear you, um, and also the frequency response of it. So some microphones might be better for different types of instruments, um, etc. Figuring that out is part of the fun of this whole enterprise, but again, I've never heard someone buy an Audio Technica 182020 and say, oh, this is a piece of crap, I wasted 100 bucks. It's, it's a great start. Uh, next, you might need a MIDI controller. Um, this is uh, uh, gonna be a really useful tool if you're on the production side, um, or if you're uh, on the recording for somebody else's side and your instrument is a piano, right? So MIDI controllers uh, is a general term again, and usually what people mean when they say MIDI controller is a thing that looks like a piano but doesn't produce sound on its own, right? So the idea is it, it just has the keys, you plug it into your computer over USB or through your interface using a MIDI cable, 
Um, and uh, it will just produce the digital zeros and ones. It'll produce the, the C, D, E, F, G, um, and then you feed that to your VST and it turns into the lip, right? Um, so that's what that is. Now, like I said, very general category. You can get MIDI controllers that are not pianos. You can get a MIDI controller that is a guitar. You can get one that is uh, a saxophone. Uh, those are typically more expensive. Um, the reason I recommend you have a MIDI controller, even if you're not a piano player, is because if you're doing anything with Reaper that involves MIDI, which, spoiler alert, we're going to do that today, uh, it will save you a lot of time. Uh, now, it's not required, um, and you, it's possible to get very good at using Reaper to do MIDI without one, uh, but if you have any sort of piano skill whatsoever, like literally anything beyond knowing that the key next to the two black bars is C, literally any skill level above that, a MIDI controller will probably save you time, so definitely consider it. Um, if you were to get uh, like the standard-ish piano one, which I probably should have named the price for here, um, I would say Alesis and uh, I think it's M49, has 49 keys, it's probably enough octaves to be dangerous, um, and uh, it's, it's, it doesn't have weighted keys, it's not going to be, you're not going to be playing Chopin on it or anything like that, but it's, again, it's, the theme here is, don't worry about that, right? I'm going to keep saying this over and over again, it's like the biggest thing that you can do to start producing music is to start, is stop worrying about it. Is this good enough? Is this the best thing you can do? Analysis paralysis is what kills every like like ninety nine percent of musicians. So I'm just saying, get the wrong thing, you know, get the wrong thing, and then figure out why it was wrong for you, and then solve those problems, right? Don't wait for someone else to tell you what the best thing is. They're wrong. I'm wrong. Um, <laughs> the most important thing that you can get out of this entire list, actually, that's a lie. Most all, all these other things are important too, but. Um, is a decent way of playing back your audio, right? Um, so you, you don't want to be doing that off your laptop speakers. You don't want to be doing that off the headphones that came with your iPod or your iPhone, whatever the other kids are using these days. Um, you want so something, whether it's a headphones or a speakers, um, that will produce a uh, very flat frequency response, meaning that it will produce the original audio that your computer is telling it to with as little modification as possible as little additional bass, as little additional treble, whatever, right? You just want it to sound as clear as possible. Because you want to be making those types of tweaks to your song um, with as little modification to the original what happened when you were playing as possible, um, so that that's the reference, right? And then like someone who's listening with their beats by Dr. Dre is probably gonna get a hugely bass, bassy version of that, and that's fine for them. They spent the money on the beats by Dr. Dre, that's what they want, but they should get that additional bass on top of your version that didn't have, also have that, right? Because uh, if you have the beats by Dr. Dre and you're uh, recording with those, then you are gonna be like, oh, this song has too much bass, let me turn it down. And then anybody who doesn't have beats by Dr. Dre is gonna not hear your bass guitars, right? Um, and Sony MDR 7506, literally like, uh, 10,000 positive reviews on Amazon. Like, it, this thing's been around for 30 years. It, everybody uses it. Um, you will not go wrong with this. Um, if you're not so hot on using headphones, uh, I would recommend uh, looking for a pair of mon what they call monitor uh, speakers. Uh, so if they also refer to the Sony MDRs as monitor headphones, monitor, again, kind of being the one word version of the not beats by Dr. Dre bass, right? Um, flat frequency response, et cetera. Uh, M Audio makes a good pair. I don't feel confident recommending a, a pair of headphones, uh, well, a pair of monitors. Um, yeah. They're good ones. I don't know enough about that to make a recommendation. You probably should be using headphones anyways. That's a TLDR. How are we doing on time? No, not great. Uh, okay, so uh, the live demo goes here. So uh, I'm going to switch over to Reaper, and I'm going to start a new project. Um, no. So, um, Finish tape. <laughs> okay, so what you might have noticed here is that the minute that I started a new project, Reaper asked me what I wanted to save that file as. That's actually not default behavior for Reaper. It is a setting that you can tick, and I can't recommend it enough. That's because um, there's a different setting in Reaper that makes it automatically save every five minutes. I come from the software world. I have never hit save in my life because every software development tool saves literally the minute they click the key, right? So I forget to save all the time. 
Reaper will save every five minutes for me. That limits the amount of data loss that's possible. It won't do this unless you've saved at least once. We've saved at least once. So that's the most important thing. Um, so that, okay. now we've got a Reaper project in, uh, uh, going here. And uh, I'm gonna go through a, a couple of generalized concepts. Um, and we're gonna work our way to uh, about eight bars of a video game cover that we're gonna do right, right here. The right side's really blurry, I don't know. We're, that's just the uh, thingy, the, the, the projector. You know how much I can do about that. If something is super unclear, please ask me to clarify it. Um, so it's actually good that you pointed that out because I totally forgot about that. I'm gonna click here at this thing at the top right, which I know you can't read that, but it says 48 kilohertz, 20 bit, 24 bit wave, uh, colon, two slash two channels, 128 samples, 6.2 milliseconds, ASIO. That's a lot of garbage. That's a lot of, uh, I don't expect you to know what that means, but if, it turns out if you click on that, you you get, uh, that's a shortcut to the audio hardware configuration screen. So the most relevant thing here is that in whatever uh, software you use, you want to tell it to be using uh, a, a, an audio system called ASIO, or ASIO, however you want to pronounce it. Um, th this is a Windows specific thing. On Mac OS, it'll probably be Core Audio or something like that. Uh, I think it's actually automatically configured on Mac OS, so maybe get a Mac, whatever. Um, but on Windows, it's called ASIO, and what that does is, uh, the shortest version is, it skips all the Windows audio processing where it makes its audio with other programs, um, and that makes it so that the audio that Reaper tells your speakers, your headphones to produce, comes out much sooner. Um, so we, uh, the term for that is latency. That's a measure of how long it takes for audio to get from one side of the system, meaning from my voice, um, to the other side of the system, meaning the speakers. And you want to find a way to get that under, at the very highest, 20 milliseconds. Any higher than that, and uh, most musicians will start to hear something's up, right? If you use Wave Out, you will be lucky to get under 70 milliseconds, and Wave Out is the default Windows audio system. So you're gonna wanna set it to ASIO, and hopefully you have a piece of uh, audio hardware uh, 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 that's compatible with that. Most audio interfaces that you buy will be, but the audio system that's just built into your computer probably won't be. Um, at least not without a, 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 you setting up a driver manually. But you already did this, so it's okay. You already got this. Make sure it's being used over ASIO, and we're great. Now, the other thing, uh, again, there's a bunch of alphabet soup up there. You want to check the sample rate, uh, which is um, too scientific for it to get into here, but if you're working uh, by yourself, Make sure it's something like 44,000 or 48,000. If you're working with some, if you're recording a song for someone else or, or recording a track for someone else, um, make sure that they tell you what sample rate that they need and that you put that in here. Um, the next thing is uh, going to be uh, what we call buffer size. So the shortest version of that is whatever audio chip you're using, whether it's the one built into this audio interface or the one built into your laptop, uh, has a certain space for a certain amount of data in it. Um, and you want that to be as low as possible, because that's one of those things that will reduce your latency. If you start to hear audio crackle, that means that your computer is not filling that amount of memory fast enough to produce the audio in real time. And so, generally speaking, increasing this number will increase the amount of memory you've allocated to, to that, and that will, reduce, that will reduce the likeliness that that crackling will happen, because you're literally giving your computer more time to produce the audio. Uh, so there's a, a trade-off there. Um, if, your audio, if your computer slash interface isn't good enough, you need to increase the latency in order to get smooth audio playback. So this is one of the places where getting a good computer and an audio interface will matter. So that's super important. Again, just make sure you're matching up uh, the uh, sample rate and the uh, audio bit rate with whatever your producer or you says. So again, right here, we've got 6.2 milliseconds of latency. That means when I play into the microphone, you're probably not gonna notice the difference. That's great. Now, what we've got here, and I've reduced the screen resolution a lot to help you guys see on the projector. Again, if something is unclear, please let me know. I will do my best to, to resolve it. So what we've got here is what we call the timeline. So Reaper will organize your song as a list of things happening and when they happen, right? So at, at the top here, it's probably pretty small to see, but hopefully you will see that it says 1.1.00 um, with a line under it and then 0.0 with a little bar. 
So 1.1.00 is measure one, beat one, millisecond zero. I don't know. Um, and then the time code in seconds is right under that. I can zoom in with the mouse wheel and you'll actually see that this splits into measure one, beat two, three, four. And I can click on any of these and we can move um, what's called, I don't actually know what that's called. Let's say it's the cursor um, there. Um, so that'll actually control, when I push space to play the song, that'll control where it starts. Now, there's nothing in the song. So when I click this, nothing happens, right? But I can at least go over here and click the metronome, and you should all hopefully be able to hear that there's a click. Um, so there's a bunch of uh, uh, things around here. I'm gonna try to cover things only as they're relevant. Um, and I'm actually going to, uh, in the name of timeliness, I'm going to remember the hotkey for a new tab, and I'm gonna open the finished key, uh, just so I can uh, remember how things go. All right. I just opened the same project again. It's the way you reverse, everybody. Um, uh, and we want the finished. Okay. All right, so I believe that we're uh, uh, going to... Who that was me. All right, so we're gonna be starting with a tempo of 136. And we're gonna do a Smash Brothers cover. Uh, which is great, because there's like 700 songs in that. Uh, so everybody's got a favorite. And uh, we're gonna do mine today. So, um, the first thing that I'm gonna do is uh, set the tempo to 136. And hopefully you all noticed that when I did that, uh, measure two no longer says it starts at two seconds. Right, so this updates in real time. So that's great. We wanna start actually putting stuff into our song. So I'm gonna, the way you do that is by adding tracks. Um, so I'm gonna double click over here and you'll see a thing show up, right? This black thing is your list of tracks. You can add a bunch of them, and you can name them. So I'm actually gonna do that. I'm gonna name this one Piano, and I'm gonna name this one, um, and what's, in, what's over here? Okay, yeah, I'm gonna alto sax. That's really important. That's the only instrument that actually exists in this room, so I need that. <laughs> uh, bass guitar, and uh, hot tip. I'm not actually, uh, so I'm not actually gonna click on that blank space down there, and press tab to go down there, right? So that's, uh, hot tip number one is like, with music uh, software, just like any pro other productivity software. Um, Microsoft Word, uh, IntelliJ for our software development, uh, software developer. You wanna learn how to do things once, and then if possible, never do them again, right? So like, yeah, it's helpful to know if you double click here, you can type in there, but it's even more helpful to know that like, when you end up putting piano one, piano two, piano three, copy and paste piano, push tab, paste it, put one, two, three, and four, et cetera. These little hacks will save you so much time. I'm not gonna spend too much time on that type of stuff today because we don't have that much time. Um, but uh, doing that on a daily basis, you know, as you uh, are recording, it's gonna be one of the ways that this becomes less mind numbing, right? Uh, so here are our four parts. And uh, I'm actually uh, going to color code these. Uh, this is actually the first thing that I ever do on any new song is set up a color code because I don't want to read the titles, right? That's really small up there and if I was on my computer at home, it'd be even smaller. So I'm gonna make uh, piano yellow, um, etc. And I'm gonna make drums, uh, I usually make drums purple and bass guitar blue. Um, there's no standard for this. Pick something you'll remember and uh, go with it. Because um, this is just to help you. Um, and probably no one else will ever see it. Um, so, uh, I'm going to start off by uh, putting in a baseline. And uh, actually, I'm going to start it on measure two. And the reason is, if I start it on measure one, then when I start recording, I need to start playing literally the second I push record. And I'm one person, I can't do that. So I want to be able to have a count off. Um, but it's gonna be super weird if I start this on a measure two. So most uh, uh, audio production environments will let you do something like uh, start a measure zero. So now this is measure zero, this is measure one, everybody's happy. 
So I'm going to start with a baseline, right? And uh, I'm going to zoom out a little bit. Four measures of baseline. Uh, that's fake news. I'm going to do one measure of baseline. Uh, and I'm going to do that by inserting a new MIDI edit. The reason I'm doing that is if you look around, I don't have a bass guitar. So I'm going to use a VST to do that. Um, and if you're one of those people who came here because you want to learn for, to record for other people, this might be the part where you tune out. Don't, because you probably need to have some proficiency with this skill as well. Um, so that, for example, if you need to record a song for someone else and they haven't given you a backing track yet, you want to at least have something to play to, right? And you want to have the ability to um, fill in some of those dots for, for you uh, for yourself, right? We're gonna do this. Um, so here's that MIDI item. As I said, it lasts one measure, and part of why I color-coded the track is because now everything that I put it in it will also be purple, right? So you can imagine when I've got 32 tracks, you know, a big band of 48 people, having everybody's part be gray, it's not gonna work, right? But now I just know uh, that bass guitar is purple, so if I double-click on the purple thing, you're probably gonna hear that. Great, so we're gonna go in here, and uh, we're gonna double-click on this, and we're gonna see what's called the piano roll. And so this is kind of like its own timeline, a list of things happening, only now that list of things is notes. And when I put a note in here by clicking and dragging, you'll hear it, just kidding, no you won't. Uh, what, what, what sound are you expecting to hear? It's a bass guitar, yes, but you only know that because I named the track that. Right, so we need to tell Reaper um, what to do with this MIDI data. Um, and the short version, uh, I'm gonna give, uh, give you guys a very short, inefficient version of this. Um, in Reaper, the way that you do this is, if you look over here at the right side of any track, there's a little icon that says FX. So click on that, and uh, it's gonna be like, you don't have any effects, what are you talking about? So here's a list of every, uh, every VST that I have installed on this computer. Uh, now, a bunch of these came with Reaper, many of them did not. I'm actually going to um, look for a uh, instrument, so Reaper helps sort a little bit, and I'm going to pick um, an instrument called the Contact 5. Uh, contact is part of the um, Native Instruments Contact com Native Instruments Complete um, Contact Complete software suite, and it is a VST that um, allows many other pieces of software to understand any data and produce audio for you. So it's kind of a middleman VST. And um, when you open it, um, you'll see all the software that you have on the computer that also knows how to work with Contact Complete. Uh, now there's lots of choices. Um, a bunch of these came with Contact Complete. That's what you pay the $500 for, right? Uh, some of these did not. Like Super Audio Cart is a VST that uh, knows how to produce Super Nintendo samples and um, Game Boy um, oscillators and stuff like that. So that's pretty cool. We need a bass guitar. We could use Super Audio Cart for that. That would have to be pretty dope, but I didn't do that in rehearsal, so we're not doing that today. Um, Contact Factory Library is a good one that has like uh, pretty much like every instrument you can imagine. They're not great, but they'll get the job done, right? It's not the best saxophone VST ever, but it is a saxophone VST. Um, so I'm gonna do uh, Skype J Bass, which is a really cool um, VST uh, that sounds just like a, a bass guitar. Like, it's really amazing how much it sounds like one. Um, so now, when I go back here into the MIDI roll, and I click on this note that I added, it produces a sound. And you can debate whether or not that sounds like a bass guitar. That's probably because bass guitars don't usually play that. Okay, so that's really boomy, but it sounds like a bass guitar, right? So here's the bass line that I'm hearing in my head. It goes ba 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 ba. So we're gonna put that in. So that first note, bump, is a C. So uh, let's not do that one. Let's do this one. That's a good C. Uh, so. I'm pretty sure that's like dotted uh, quarter note-ish thing. Uh, did I put too many? No, that's right. Uh, actually, so it's, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm drunk. This is what I meant. This is what I meant. I, I, I meant dotted eighth note. Uh, okay, so now I can click like at the start of this item and when I push space, Reaper will actually play what I've told it to. And it'll end when there's 
there's nothing left. And I can do that out here too. Now, you might have heard a significant difference between what I sang and what, what's being played. What I sang was staccato, ba, ba, bum, ba, 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 bum. Uh, and you need to tell Reaper that. Now, there's no click on this and make it staccato button, right? So what you have to do is you just take this length, right? So what, notice that when I point to the right end of an object, it becomes a little the handle that looks like the end of that object. When I click and drag it, I can actually shorten this note. I can do the same thing from the other side, but that's not what I really want to do. Uh, you can also click and drag in the, in the note itself to do that, uh, to, to move the note up and down or left and right. Um, but for now, we just want to make the note staccato. Oh, that's not right. Don't want to add a note there. So a lot like um, most other productivity tasks, right? Most of the what you what you need to do is learn how to communicate the ideas that you have in your brain to a computer. The computer is going to do exactly what you tell it to do, right? So if you tell it to play a dotted eighth note, it's going to. You need to learn to speak its language in order to be able to figure out that like a staccato note is just the same thing as telling it to play a single sixteenth note, um, which is not intuitive. But you, you start to learn that language over time, right? So now we've got this one measure of big sign, right? Um, but this is one measure, and we're trying to get four measures of song, right? So I'm going to uh, so I'm going to sing the whole four measure big sign. So as you might have heard, the second measure sounds a lot like the first one. So I'm going to insert a new MIDI item in the wrong track. Um, insert a new MIDI item. And I'm going to double click it and start putting, just kidding, I'm not gonna do that. Uh, you learn how to do things once and then never do them again. So in Reaper, when you hold control and you click on something, you can drag it and it will create a duplicate of it. So never do things again, never do work, right? Like that's so crucial. And as you might have heard, uh, might remember from that bass line that I sang, actually the fourth measure is the same, so we're gonna do that. And actually, if you might remember uh, the bass on this side, the third measure, not the same, but close enough that we're better off doing this, right? Let's copy it, and then let's um, let's just take everything. So I'm gonna right click and drag to select everything, and I'm gonna hold control and push up and down. I think that is as many notes as I needed. That's not true. Uh, okay, so now I'm gonna play this. So, remember how I said MIDI controller optional, right? I've learned a lot of great tricks for writing MIDI um, in a way that doesn't make me want to die, right? But if you have a MIDI controller and you're a, a, an accomplished pianist or something like that, this could be a lot faster. You could put the notes in in real time, right? Like just sit there and push your keys, bar, 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 bar. or you could um, do it uh, where uh, you tell it, I want 16th notes now and just put the 16th notes in at your leisure at whatever speed you want, and it's just gonna advance one 16th note. There's a lot of other input options that open up even if you have a mini controller. So again, figure out what's best for you and, and then do that. So here's the baseline altogether. Now, I don't wanna keep pushing space over and over again to make it play that, so I'm gonna click this little blue button here, and that will make it repeat from the start. Just kidding, the start is actually measure zero. So we want to tell it where to repeat from and to. So I'm going to just click and drag with the left mouse button and do that. And now, when I when it, the repeat ends, it'll just go there. And this is really great if you just want to be listening to it. If you just want to be listening to it and relaxing and thinking of ideas. Um, or if you want to uh, produce a, a bunch of different takes of the same thing. Right, like, uh, I can't hit the 16th note wrong, I'm just gonna, gonna keep boiling on it until I get it, and you don't wanna keep being recorded over and over again. So that's that. Uh, another pro tip, uh, um, every item, every MIDI item has properties. One such useful property is, uh, actually, uh, let's scroll all the way down here. Uh, oh man, this screen is struggling a little. Uh, tell you what, hotkey, F2. Uh, it was gonna be item properties. One such useful properties, it, property is the name of the take. So I'm gonna do something like, 
bass guitar A1, right? Uh, so that shows up here now, and I'm gonna actually do that. I'm, I'm gonna copy this over. And now I can see at a glance, um, bass guitar A2. Now I can see at a glance, this is the measure that's different, right? Um, now, you might also be able to see that from the fact that literally the MIDI pattern looks different, but what if it was like, uh, like this MIDI pattern is kind of opposite in terms of it going up instead of down, but maybe it's like, uh, maybe it's the lick in all 12 keys. That's gonna be the same pattern. You might not really be able to distinguish that. Having the name on it will save you a lot of time. Um, so cool, that's our bass guitar part. Um, I'm going to start uh, the drum part now, and I'm uh, going to do a little bit of notation of this, but we're way behind on time. So I'm going to end up copying some stuff from the uh, finished cake that I'm out of the oven. Um, so uh, again, same thing from before. No sound comes out. You need to tell it what a drum is. We're going to do that using a VSD instrument called Addictive Drums. This is the VSD I used before, Superior Drummer. It's also quite good. Um, it's just uh, that it is uh, not as good as Superior Drummer and also isn't 400 gigabytes, so that's great. Um, so Superior Drummer has a support for a bunch of different, uh, uh, this is going to be a challenge, a uh, bunch of different uh, drum kick types. Uh, let's go all the way around, far away. Uh, we're going to I don't own all these, it just shows you all of them because it wants to you know, uh, entice you into buying them. Uh, so we're going to do a, did I go past, so this, this is funk, and uh, not, damn, I went past, all right, uh, how's everybody doing today? Um, uh, okay, don't keep going, don't keep going, okay, this is the one, I want, a lot of times VSD will let you preview what they sound like. All right, so this is good enough for now. We're gonna end up throwing it out anyways because it's coming from the finished uh, cake. But again, we're gonna go in here and we're gonna start putting notes. Just kidding, what's a B flat on drums, right? So the short version is, um, Reaper doesn't know uh, what a C is. It doesn't know what a snare drum is. Um, and so this information over here on the left, this keyboard, is useless to us. So we're actually going to get rid of that, and we're just going to switch to named notes mode. And what that is is, so that sounds like an open hi-hat. We're going to double click on here and just write down that this is an open hi-hat, right? And now when I go here and I'm like, oh, I want open hi-hat eighth notes, I know to put it on this line, right? So all you have to do is, for every instrument on a drum kit, that. Right, and that counts for uh, all the different levels of open hi hatness. There's probably a way to do this more automatedly, um, but I just did it once and then uh, found out how to do it never again. So I'm going to get rid of this drum track, and I'm actually going to import a new track from template. Because actually, one of the uh, options, if you right click on a track, is save track as track template. That list of what MIDI note corresponds to what drum instrument is a property of the track. So if I uh, insert track from template um, and uh, click drum template, make template or send, um, it saves a bunch of things that I've done before. Um, most importantly, uh, the uh, not the VSD because I'm bad. So I'm gonna do that in here. Uh, and we're gonna do this song and dance again. I'm gonna, uh, couldn't give me the right arrow in 720p. Uh, so I'm going to do this again. This is a great advertisement for addictive drums, I tell you what. Uh, did I go past them? Yes. See that I've already done this, right? So this is super useful information, and it's accurate. Theoretically, 
this is going off the rails. All right, so I'm going to I'm going to actually uh, plan B for how to do this. Is you can go in here in the MIDI piano roll and do the same thing. Save uh, the. Uh, the uh, I didn't do this. Okay. Uh, uh, plan B. So actually, uh, this is even a better lesson because all the stuff I just did with setting up the tracks, I don't even do that anymore. I save for my band. I save the template of what a new song looks like. Uh, so I'm gonna go to Full Combo 2, because that's the name of my band. Yes, save. Uh, and we're going to come in here. And uh, this is a new track for my band. Uh, and I've got a drum track in here. I'm gonna do this new thing. Sorry guys, this is gonna go a little bit uh, over time, probably because of this. But if you look in here, this is definitely accurate. Um, so I'm gonna save the note names. Uh, hi, drums are cool. Uh, and we'll go back to uh, recent projects and it's the not finished. No. We are rolling with the punches here, ladies and gentlemen. We're gonna go back in here and we're gonna load those notes in the CC names. So what happened was I only had the CC names for Superior Drummer, and I don't have a Superior Drummer. But now, Kick Drum. Why is it for some sound? Now this is all accurate. I know what's going on. Uh, I don't know that I'll be fixing the full screen resolution. Now what it actually looks like, and we have up here and symbols up here. It's all great. So I'm gonna start writing that groove now, uh, and I'm gonna make that the kick drum sound like the bass drum, all right? And uh, so that should line up with everything else. Shaft. Um, cool. Uh, so we're gonna do that a bunch of times. Again, we don't want to do anything twice, so we're just gonna keep copying this stuff. I want to go over the, the concept of MIDI velocity. So every MIDI note is two, uh, two major problems, right? There's a lot, actually. But the two big ones are what pitch it is, which in this case determines what drum we're hitting or what cymbal we're hitting, and then velocity, which is a weird name for how loud it is. And actually, drums is the place where it makes the most sense because it roughly maps to the velocity of the stick hitting the drum, right? So the greater the velocity, the louder of the note, which makes a lot less sense if you're talking about a flute. Right? But the idea is still the same. A higher velocity note on a flute will tend to be louder. And that's actually an important concept. Velocity is not the same thing as volume. It's roughly the same. 
Because if you think about um, like a flute, if you're playing a flute softly, it sounds quite differently than if you're like really wailing on it, right? Same thing with a saxophone. Um, same thing with a drum. A soft note on a drum will be a lot less distorted. And velocity, as opposed to volume, is a way that you can tell your VSD what, which one of those types of things you want, right? And so that's actually super important with things like drums, where like this drum beat sounds super robotic right now, because what drummer actually produces the same note more than once, right? It's really robotic sounding. So one way you can get a much better sound right off the bat is some variation in, in velocity. And so if you look down here at the bottom, there's actually a graph of all the notes and their velocities. And uh, so you can take each of them and move them up or down, or you can click on the note and there's a little line in them, which actually represents the velocity. Uh, it's actually kind of annoying when you click on that by accident and you're trying to move the note up and down. You get used to that. So we're gonna leave these notes um, loud enough, right? Uh, as their accents. And again, we told the the drums, make it sound like we're hitting a different part of the hi hat for this, right? Uh, you're gonna wanna learn these tricks for your VST. Uh, but uh, another trick you're gonna learn is don't click on all the notes. Just right click here and change all of them at once. Uh, Right? So we're gonna make all these notes louder and all these notes softer. So that's already a lot more human sounding. But we're actually gonna also replicate the fact that most drummers have crappy left hands. So if they're alternating 16th notes, now uh, <laughs> this note is gonna be softer and this note is gonna be softer. Uh, crap, 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 crap. It's softer, pretend I made it softer. And also this one's a little bit softer too. And we're even gonna to go a step further. I'm gonna click H for humanize, and that's gonna tell Reverb, hey, all this MIDI data, just mess it up a little bit. Make some of the notes like 10% louder, some of them 5% louder, some of them softer. A couple of them, make them a little bit late. Do that. Um, all these techniques combined will make it so that even not that great VSD will usually produce pretty reasonable the facsimile of a human being playing drums. So we're gonna go to the finished cake now, and uh, we are going to just take this drum line, and uh, I'm gonna be way over time, but that's okay. Uh, so we're gonna do that. Um, you stick to it forever. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I'm, I'm a great instructor. I'm doing everything wrong so that you don't have to. <laughs> Yes, I didn't. Uh, I, be, most drummers will usually uh, find a groove and stick to it for a fairly long amount of time. In computer speak, copy and paste, copy and paste, copy and paste. And then go into each individual one, right? And then, so I actually label these one, two, three, and four, one, two, three, and four. Each one has like a subtle variation. Uh, so, so that one has that one sixteenth note added in there. Back to the original one, but with an open hi hat. Back to the original one, but with a two beat fill, right? Copy paste and then just make changes from there. Cool. Um, so now we've got um, a, uh, a thingy and a thingy, a drum line and a bass guitar line. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the bass guitar line, uh, but I'll come back to that later. Because uh, we want to do some cooler stuff in there too, uh, but. Uh, we need to save time. So I'm gonna briefly go over piano. That's it. Uh, no. Because uh, that is uh, the only, uh, we, we wanna have some sort of melodic instrument now. Uh, so 
Again, same idea as before. You need to tell it what instrument to play. Thankfully, you don't need to name the notes this time. I'm going to use addictive keys. Same company as addictive um, drums, which is pretty cool. Uh, uh, the Explore. We're going to do this song and dance again, but there's a lot less options. Uh, and I want like a nice, thick sounding road. That's not right. That's not right at all. <laughs> So that's good enough for now, and I think that should be enough to get a note up. Yeah, that's a great note too. <laughs> so in tune and unique. Um, okay, so uh, piano. So piano charts um, are very time consuming to, edit, to put in by hand, get a control, and also be good at piano. I, I did one of those things. See if you can figure out which. Um, so. Um, Gonna just kind of go with the chord progression, and uh, piano is just gonna be a comping instrument. So uh, we're gonna start off with a nice fat C major, uh, C minor chord. So that's uh, the first, the fifth. Let's put in a little bit of seventh action right here, and uh, hopefully that was the seventh. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, and then uh, let's put in the third, and let's hear all this together. Right click and select. And down. Uh, right. So that's a nice chord, right there, cool. Uh, it's a Rhodes though, right? Like Rhodes, they never play notes at the same time. So we're going to uh, move this note a little bit later. And you can see that as I drag notes, they split, they, uh, they stick to the grid. I'm gonna hold shift to tell Reaper not to do that because I wanna just make this a little bit later and then this a little bit less late and this a little bit less late. And now when I play it, So that sounds kind of more a little bit like a human going, which I understand pianists do sometimes. Uh, so you want to do stuff like that, right? And then um, there's more stuff that I wanted to talk about, but we're so far behind that it's time to pull out that finished cake. Yeah. Uh, so we're going to go in here. And usually, by the way, uh, fun fact, uh, tracks are, can also be folders of tracks. Um, so every MIDI item that I put in either of these two tracks, uh, sends its audio up to this track, which then sends its audio up to this track, which then sends its audio up to master. Uh, so that's how Reaper works. Most other audio tools probably have a similar concept. Uh, but I'm gonna copy all this stuff in here, and we'll just open it up in the piano roll after, and uh, see if there's anything interesting to talk about. So we'll hear it once. So this is all I did. Um, just to tie that loop from before, the thing I did with the, I don't remember the term for like staggering the notes like that, but just doing stuff like that if you're working in MIDI is the trick to making people not realize that you're working in MIDI, right? So I'm gonna play the song now and uh, hopefully you'll hear some of the other stuff that it did to that effect. So I humanized some of the audio so not every note's at the same volume. That's pretty much it. Note. Oh, I like that. Um, which is how you know that I did that on purpose the other day rehearsal. <laughs> so, last thing, I'm going to go back to the finished cake for the bass line. And I'm going to point out some cool things that I didn't hear. Um, so. So I'm going to solo this and hopefully you'll be able to hear some of it. Scarby J Bass is a VST that's one of the reasons I said it was very good is because you can tell it. I want you to play plucked and slapped, which is really cool for doing stuff like this. All right, this doesn't sound as cool as it did the other day, so I'm gonna get rid of this. Cool. 
Yeah, so uh, what I did actually was I told it that I wanted to, I'm gonna get rid of this so it's more room to work with, and uh, yes. So you're gonna wanna read the manual for your VST to find stuff like this out. Um, but it turns out um, on Scrappy Davis, if you play a uh, C in this octave, um, that is a signal to switch to the slash uh, articulation. Right, so everything that happens once I put that note in, all these notes, it's, it interprets them as slapped notes. And um, Scotty J Bass is also smart enough to do things like, if you have a really low velocity note on the bass guitar, you probably meant to mute that note. You're probably telling the bassist, don't actually play that note, but just do that thing where they're like holding their finger against the string and they pluck it, so it just kind of goes Right, so that combined with the slapping sounds pretty dope. Also, when I made this note overlap this note, um, it tells the bassist to do that thing where they play the note and then they just stick another finger on there. They call it a hammer on, and it's kind of their equivalent of like a legato note on a different instrument. For Scotty J bass, all you have to do is make this note long enough to overlap the other note. So then, the other cool thing that I did is over here. And uh, so that's pretty dope, right? It's when bass just goes um, And how did I do that? Well, a couple of things I had to do. One is I had to stick this on here. This is an E in this octave, and when you, it turns out that for Scrappy J bass, when you put that in, it forces Scrappy J bass to play only notes on the E string. They actually went and recorded an E on this string, an E on that string, an E on that string, an E on that string, to make it sound, uh, so that they could then write software that tries to figure out what an actual basis would produce for fingerings, right? By doing that note way down there where there's no actual note for a bass guitar, I tell Scarby J bass, don't do that, that's a cool feature, don't do that for now, please just use the E from the string. And then, uh, uh, this overlapping note up here, um, uh, plus, this, the sustain pedal tells it to not play those notes normally, it tells it to go right? Now, what's a sustain pedal? It's the same thing as on a piano, um, where you hold the sustain pedal with your foot and play the notes, and it will uh, not stop the notes uh, as long as that's held. That also happens in MIDI. Um, but again, VSTs are uh, free to interpret that how they want, right? So that's cool. We talked a lot about MIDI. Here's our song so far. Actually, uh, whatever. I have to impress any of you. I do actually. I very much need to impress all of you. Uh, uh, this is uh, not how I expected it to look. Okay, actually, that's that's right. I think that's right. Okay, great. We're getting audio out from there. And uh, I'll just go in there. Great. So now we're going to actually, actually record some charts. Great. Um, so first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to start the start the song. And again, we're not starting at beat zero, right? Uh, but if I start at the, the start of the song and then I uh, then I click record, it's going to be like, wait, record? What are you talking about? Record what? Record when? Record why? Right? So you need to answer all those questions. Um, so the way that we do that one is you set the uh, cursor where you want to start recording. Right? Next, you need to tell it what to record. Um, you want to record alto sax. Right? Um, where do we want to record that? We want to record that into the alto sax track. That seems pretty on brand for that track, I would assume. Right? So we're going to click on the alto sax track. There's a button labeled record arm and disarm. This is pretty universal for most digital audio workstations. They'll all have some equivalent concept, because they all have equivalent concept of tracks. And so you need to tell the digital, digital audio workstation where to record. It may be more than one track. It may be no, well, probably not no tracks, but it could be every track, right? It doesn't know. If you have your whole band, you probably want it to record into every track, right? So we're gonna click here, and notice that when I do that, um, as I start speaking into this microphone, um, the audio levels start to show up on the start to show up on down there. Okay, it's still hearing me from here, right? But it starts to show up on that track. Um, and um, 
Yes, so that's that bad. Um, and then in Reaper, you'll also want to tell that track where it's getting its, uh, its recording data from. So here's where you would say, I want to record from record MIDI from a keyboard, uh, but actually we want to record from input one on our interface, um, which is the left XLR, as you can see, it's plugged in. If I go to input two, you're gonna see that this line stops moving, right? So that's not what we want, we want input one. And now, uh, so now I'm going to click record again, and it's not going to give me a dialog box. As you can see, as I talk into it, it's going to be recorded. And as I talk into it, it's going to be recorded. <laughs> so actually, because it's getting me from the mains too, there's this cool phasing. That as I talk into it, it's gonna be recorded. Yeah, so that's what my voice sounds like. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> um, so a couple of quick uh, things to talk about, right? So uh, there's a concept of punching in, all right? So uh, I liked this whole take, uh, except for the part where you can hear my voice. And as I talk into it, it's gonna be recorded. Not ideal. So I'm actually just going to put, put the, the cursor here and uh, start recording here. And I'm still going to talk because I don't want to put my saxophone right now. And Reaper is smart enough to know what you meant. It, it wants you to, it, it realizes that you want to prepare this take of me saying that versus the previous take. And I'm still going to talk because I don't want to put my saxophone right now. As I talk into it, it's going to be recorded. Talk because I don't want to put my saxophone Talk into it, so you, you, now you can audition takes, right? So this is a pretty decent workflow for um, uh, making sure that um, if you play the entire 16th note run correctly, except for that one B flat, don't record the entire 16th note run. Just highlight this section and then record that. Record that, record that, record that. Uh, actually, I didn't set the option that makes it only record that one chunk, but that exists, believe me. Uh, so I'm going to get rid of all this now. So I'm actually going to uh, do some recording of the saxophone instruments. Um, <coughs> good luck me. I have not played in an hour. This thing is probably dry as hell and I am not tuned. So, but actually, as you'll see, playing bad is kind of part of the point of this presentation. Um, that's my excuse. Um, a couple of things before I go on. You might notice that when I uh, tell it to record here, it actually starts the playback all the way back there. Um, well, actually, it doesn't. It starts a count off back there. That's a reaper. That's a reaper setting, right? Um, so I had to tell it that I wanted to do that. You'll find that one, set it, and forget it. But then the other thing is, I actually don't want to start it recording here um, because, like I said, this is just the same problem that I had before. If I start recording here, then um, uh, once the re recording actually starts, I probably am not going to start playing at that exact millisecond. And if, even if I do, I'll probably like cut off the attack a little bit. So what I like to do is actually start the recording back here, get a couple of seconds of silence in the recording. So uh, let's see what happens. Uh, ta -ta -ta. Uh, uh, let's see what happens here. So uh, I was trying to meme about that song sounding like the Flintstones. It's actually Gourmet Race from Kirby's Adventure. Uh, but I screwed up uh, uh, a lot of that. But it's okay. I can play it back. Distinctly not how the Flintstones goes. And I also left this solo so I couldn't hear it. Um, but this is good enough for now. Remember how I said capture a couple of seconds of silence before? That's because now we can just shave that off, right? So do that. Uh, and I'm actually going to go ahead and uh, time selection auto punch. Yeah, that's not right. So we're going to uh, we're going to start the recording here, and we're going to end it here, uh, and we're going to punch in right there. Uh, and how does that actually go? So now I'm good to go. We can play the song. Cool. Uh, so that actually sounds like it. Now, uh, 
this take, if you uh, are looking really closely, the waveform uh, is not entirely fitting into the red box, right? Um, and what that means is that I, I've clipped. I should talk about that. What that means is that I've clipped. I'm playing too loud for my audio interface. Um, and so the, that's a problem because it means that there's data that is getting lost. Everything above the loudest thing that my audio interface heard just goes away. This is actually how guitars work when you put them into an overdrive pedal. You're actually taking advantage of the phenomenon that doing that with a guitar string sounds really cool, but it probably doesn't with a saxophone. So watching your levels as you record is probably the most single most important thing you can do as a person recording for someone else. Um, so the way that you can watch out for that is if you watch the volume uh, indicators down here as I'm talking, uh, and see that they get louder and they eventually approach the top, which is zero dB. Um, it's kind of weird that it's, it's like uh, uh, the top is maximum. That's because every volume measurement is measured as less than the maximum. So zero is zero less than the maximum, right? Um, whenever you, um, so if you look here at the piano track, uh, it's very difficult for you to read probably, but it says negative 6.8 there. What it's telling me is that the loudest sound waves that ever came out of that track are 6.8 uh, dB below the master. So that's pretty good, the, the maximum. That's pretty good. Zero isn't. And so when that happens, Reaper will tell you that by being by showing that number in red until you clear it. Uh, so you want to keep clearing this consistently so that you know if you fix the problem, right? And again, you don't want to just go and clear every single track because clipping on the alto sax track also made me clip on, did I kill the drum track? No, I didn't, okay. Um, also made me clip on the master track. Uh, so find a shortcut for not having to click all of them. For me, it's control, click any of them, they all go away. And then you start fixing uh, the problem, and uh, don't worry about it. So how do I fix the problem in this case? Well, there's two ways. One is I can just play with good sound quality. Um, so I kind of honked that note, and that's why it, 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 it clicked. So that's the first thing. The second thing is um, I played too close to the microphone. The third thing is we can turn the gain adjustment on the, uh, the it's a dial on the audio interface down a little bit. Any of those things will work. Um, you want to avoid turning the gain uh, too low because you don't want that your sound waves to just be like this far away, right? It's mostly just getting the echoes from the room at that point. Um, you, and you don't want that. You want to get as much signal, the saxophone, as possible without room noise. So you want to have the gain as low as you can, but also be loud, right? So turn the gain down, get close enough that you're, that, that you're pick, being picked up, but not enough that you're clipping. It's a pretty good rule for most mic instruments. Um, so I'm going to actually uh, try that again, and I'm going to, I don't know which one of those dials is gain, uh, so I'm not going to guess, and I'm just going to play softer. Uh, and uh, I'm going to punch in the rest of it. Two good notes. Cool. And uh, oh, I just glitched up the BST there. Oh. Uh, but these these two beats right here, not so hot. And you can actually do something really annoying, like play play the wrong beats over and over again to really remind yourself how bad you are. Uh, <laughs> so that's a uh, so we're just gonna record that part now. Um... show on the road. Because um, like I said, I played really bad, but this is introduction to music, recording, and production, right? So you just saw how the meat gets made, right? Like when I make one, one of my songs where I, where I play saxophone, which, spoiler alert, that song you heard before, that was not me playing saxophone. Uh, that's our band, Saxophonist, who's good, right? Um, <laughs> I play drums in that project. But uh, when I do that, that thing that I said was called punching in, Crap, I never actually uh, fixed the, uh, the clipping here. 
whatever, you're just gonna have to deal with that. Um, punching in, uh, the dirty secret, uh, when I record everything, I punch in all the time. It's like an NES boxing game. Mike, Mike, Mike Tyson's punch in, right? Like it's just constantly punching in. Sometimes I've literally taken six leaf note runs and punched in on every single note. Right? So that is one way of achieving the sound that you hear on the radio is you just have infinite takes and you um, do them in as big a take as you can to be time efficient, but as small a take as you have to to get the quality that you want. Great. Or, or you can be like me, who's a real fraud, like the most fraudulent guy you've ever met, <laughs> um, and use effects plugins. So uh, I'm gonna go into a little bit of detail about how you use those. And uh, the one that I'm gonna use right now, uh, and because I did that really choppy recording, it's not gonna be perfect. And it's also not gonna work because Melodyne is fantastic. No, it's just taking a long time to load. Oh no, kiss of death. Oh, disaster, disaster. <laughs> it's complaining that I don't have internet. Oh no. <laughs> uh, nobody look at my password. Uh, I don't even. Uh, it's, it's the stupidest thing. So yeah, um, don't use Melodyne. <laughs> it's really annoying. Um, I'm not gonna be able to fix this, but so that's a really bad. Uh, let's uh, instead use. Um, now this part of the demo is just not gonna happen. Um, so Melodyne actually uh, it will record. Basically, you need to re record your audio from Reaper into Melodyne um, by telling Melodyne record and then you push play in Reaper. And uh, what, it, what ends up happening is Melodyne will produce something that looks very much like the mini piano roll, but composed of your recorded sound. Um, and then all that stuff that I was doing in the piano roll, you can do there. Meaning, like adjusting your notes so it's in tune? Sure, yeah, that's what everybody thinks auto tune does, right? You can also, that note that I played too early, no I didn't, just slide it right over. Um, that note that I played too long, no I didn't, shorten it. Uh, and Melodyne is really good at lying and making it look like you just did it right. Um, so if you want to talk about how the sausage is made, that's how the sausage is made. Uh, unfortunately, I won't be able to show it to you because of uh, uh, technical difficulties, that's fine. Um, what I will be able to go into is other effects. Because now that you've uh, done some MIDI input, you've done some uh, basic recording, um, you want to make yourself sound good, right? So the way you do that is with other uh, effects pedals. Now I'm going to uh, stick to the ones that come with Reaper because those are free. Um, but we're going to talk about like uh, re EQ, and I'm going to unarm the recording here, and I'm going to actually I don't want to have to face how bad my playing was, so I'm gonna do effects on the piano instead. This, like, I just don't, it's so crushing hearing yourself play bad, so I'm not gonna do that. Uh, so I'm gonna solo this. Re-EQ is a plugin that uh, comes with Reaper, and it's, a, uh, it's an audio leak, a parametric equalizer. So what that does is you give it a bunch of parameters like what frequency you want to modify, uh, what frequency of the, the, the sound uh, signal you want to modify, what modification you want to apply to it, how much you want to apply that modification, and uh, it will do that for you. So I'm going to play the sound wave, the, 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 I'm going to play the first time through here, and I'm just going to put that on. And notice that as I uh, have this playing, you can see all the frequency data. Sounds like it's, you're hearing it through like water, right? And there's a lot you can do with this. Like you can make really subtle changes to just like bump up the bass, skyrocket the high end. You can even bump up some in the middle. You can decide. I just don't want this one frequency. So that's really handy for things like my saxophone has a very loud E flat key. Um, and if my saxophone is close enough to the microphone that I can play into it, you're probably also getting some E flat key in there, which you don't necessarily want. Um, with 
and equalize it, if you can find exactly where that E flat keys click is in, in the spectrum, you can remove it. Um, so that's pretty cool. Other effects that you can apply, uh, and we're gonna get rid of this. Uh, other effects. Uh, what's a cool one? A compressor. Compressor is super important. Uh, I'm so low on time that I won't be able to, to adequately de demo this, but it is a uh, effect uh, that uh, basically helps to limit uh, how much sound is being produced from that track. Um, and the reason that that's useful is you apply a limit that's well below what the actual sound was, right? Um, and what that means is uh, whenever we go over that amount of sound, we'll, we're gonna lower that track's volume. And then whenever we go back below that amount of sound, we're gonna go back to normal. And chances are what that does is you're gonna get, end up with a much more consistent volume. This is almost not, it's, it's almost mandatory for you to do on every single track because as it turns out in modern pop, like popular music, um, pretty much anything other than like chamber music, orchestra music, you have to do this because dynamics are a great idea on paper. Forte, piano, love them. Nobody wants to deal with that in their car. Nobody wants to deal with that in their iPod or in their bedroom or basically any time that they're listening to music nowadays. They just want to hear this, the music. They want to sing along to it. They don't want to have to think about, oh, well, I need to turn my volume up for this part, other than because the song's awesome, right? You want to turn up uh, because you like the song, not because it's too quiet. Um, so compressors are a way that you can do that. Um, so again, I'm going to have to cut some stuff short because we're so low on time, but um, there's all types of plugins that do all types of things like uh, like you could have a vocoder that lets you modulate your voice by a certain pitch. Um, you could, the, here's guitar rig, that's the thing that I was telling you that simulates a guitar uh, pedal board. Um, Regate, uh, which disables the track if the volume is about, uh, below a certain amount of level, uh, if the volume is below a certain amount. So that's how you would make it so that like the ambient room noise doesn't get recorded. But the second I start playing saxophone in there, we actually start recording, uh, etc. There's a lot of cool stuff. Uh, learning new plugins is half the fun. So um, here's the closest thing to our, the finished song that we're going to end up with. song and uh, you know it's not a good song but we did this in like uh, an hour and 20 minutes and that's a lot less than it was in rehearsal so that's I'm, I'm still gonna take credit for that uh, so uh, hopefully this kind of that's a little bit of light on the process of how you actually create the music like it's all doable stuff I hope that nothing that I put in there is just like hieroglyphics for you um, but it does take some practice right so let's talk about uh, some kind of workflow tips that I have. Um, so I'm gonna go back here and uh, go to presentation. If you are recording by yourself, uh, here's some things that you want to keep in mind. Oh, I didn't talk about this at all, and that's why I put this in here so I wouldn't forget. Once you're done uh, recording your thing that you're gonna send off to Dro or Jane producer, you don't want them to see this. You don't want them to see the sausage getting packed. Not just because you want them to think that you're good, but also because they don't care. Right? They know you're a fraud, they're a fraud, everybody's a fraud. They just want to take your finished product and do whatever they have to do it to make it into a song. So the way you do that is you're gonna, in Reaper, you're gonna right click uh, your song, and, oh, sorry, your track. You're gonna click render slash freeze tracks, and any of these will do, I like to render to a mono track. And that will produce a single uh, file, it's a WAV file on your hard drive, email that off, or more likely Dropbox it off, boom, you're done. Uh, sorry. Now, if I had applied any effects or if I had done anything in Melodyne, um, all that stuff gets packed into this. So, uh, this is definitely something that you want to do. Um, it, it, it's a lot easier than sending them over individual takes. Uh, so, that's cool. When you're done with your song, you can do the same thing on the entire song level by rendering the track. So if I actually click in here and go to render one file, that will produce a WAV file of the entire song. Uh, and that's what you want to do when you want to go to SoundCloud, right? You want to take that one file, that one WAV file, and put that up on SoundCloud. Great. Uh, good thing I put that note in there, because I had forgotten all about that. 
Um, so when you're recording for someone else, you want to figure out things like, all right, we probably agree that someone's melodizing our, our stuff, right? Who is it? Is it me, the recorder, or you, the producer, right? There's no one right answer. You definitely want to have agreement on those type of things, because melodizing the same track twice, it's not going to sound good, and also a lot of wasted labor. Same thing with like compressors and uh, uh, reverb and all that stuff. You want to have an answer as to who does that stuff. Um, whenever um, they tell you, um, hey, I want you to play on my song, uh, get your first draft into them the next day if you can. Like, or, you know, or at well below their deadline, because something's going to come up. They don't like how raspy your saxophone tone is. They want you to do it um, upside down underwater because they just want that particular sound, whatever. You just want to do that um, so that when they hear it and they think it's a tire fire, or even if it's a really good recording that they just want a slight change, they get, they get you that feedback with as much time as possible. Um, conversely, you should ask for things as soon as possible, right? Because maybe you don't know, like, say you're the saxophone person, the saxophone player recording for that song just now, Maybe you don't know um, how to interpret that last note. Maybe they, they want you to put a fall in on that. Um, maybe not. Ask as soon as possible. They're just gonna make their job easier. Um, finally, as the recorder, it's your job, always your job, never the, the producer's job, to be the expert of what you're doing. Um, so to give you an example, for the saxophone, where to put the mic um, to get a good sound, that's my job to know that. Right, um, and it turns out the answer is not what you'd expect, right? Like you, you would think saxophone noise comes out of the saxophone, but actually, it turns out if you uh, play with your saxophone pointing straight into the mic hole, uh, actually, most of the sound doesn't come out of that, uh, out of that hole. Um, really, only this, the sound that's left over after sound comes out of the holes comes out of that hole. So, that means two things one, you're not going to get all of the sound, you're gonna get a very honky sound. And two, it means the more keys you push down on the saxophone, the more honky that sound's gonna get. And more importantly, the louder that sound's gonna get. So you're gonna hit that low B flat, and all of a sudden you're gonna be twice as loud as your high B flat. And you're, if maybe you put a compressor on it, yeah, but maybe you didn't, and you just made more work than the other guy, right? So knowing that stuff, and it's different for every instrument, like it's, it, it's just an unending, just tiger fire of stuff that you need to know, but for your own instrument, that's your responsibility. So watch YouTube videos, go to manifest panels by attractive Brazilian men, whatever you gotta do, right? Um, to, to learn how to uh, 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 be able to contribute your recording in as efficient and useful a manner as possible. So what if you're on the other end? Uh, you're the producer. Um, so the number one thing um, is to set deadlines for yourself. Right? So hopefully some of you guys are gonna, gonna go home and be like, Reaper's awesome. Let me tinker around with it for six years, right? That's great. That's what you need to do to get good. You need to experiment, you need, you need, you need to uh, just break stuff and see where the problems are so that you can learn what you need to learn. Great. You need to actually make a song someday, right? So as soon as you feel like you've become dangerous and really can, can produce something, set a deadline. I want to make a song by the end of next month. It can be a conservative deadline, it needs to be a deadline, and you need to stick to it. Because the reality is, if you're any good at music, you know exactly where I'm going with this, you're never gonna think you're good enough. You're always gonna be like, ah, that one C sharp, uh, I guess I'll record next Tuesday, right? You're, that just never ends. Um, and let's be real, none of us are insane in learning music, right? And oh, honestly, he has deadlines too. But like none of us are ever gonna like just have that one take just come out right out the gate that's perfect. We're always gonna think something's wrong with it. And eventually you gotta shed problems and everything, right? So the number one thing is set deadlines for yourself um, because that's how you're gonna be eventually be able to start getting feedback. You're gonna put something out and it'll be terrible, um, and then you'll get feedback and the next thing will be terrible. And that's just a human thing. We've all played World of Warcraft, we've all decided to take up uh, uh, weaving and uh, you get that first uh, first recipe for like a cloth sheet and you click on it and it's like, oh, you failed. And you're like, failed at a cloth sheet, how do you do it? Well, that's because that's just how humans are. The first time you do anything is terrible, get over it. Get that first thing out as soon as possible and move on with your life.
Uh, next, if you're working with anybody else, set aggressive deadlines for them. You can be conservative within your deadline, but if you're working with someone else, lie to them. Tell them you need it two weeks before you actually need it. Because stuff happens. You know, uh, it doesn't even have to be something super serious like they got sick or death in the family. It could just be they're a talented musician who has projects for other people and something happened to one of those projects and now they're late on that project. Stuff happens. So just be aggressive with your deadlines. That way if they can't meet them, for whatever reason, legitimate or not, it doesn't kill you, right? It's, not, it's just move on, roll with the punches. Uh, do as much of the work as you can. So that goes into a lot of different categories. Uh, but this is kind of talking about things like, uh, so I didn't go into all this because we didn't have time. But if you look at my finished cake, I did things like put in um, rehearsal markers at the top. So this is letter A in the song. This is letter A a second time in the song. And this is letter B a second time, uh, the first time in the song. And I'm actually gonna go to an even more finished cake. I'm gonna go to that song from before, uh, from my band. And uh, I'm gonna show you that like, when I put together a Reaper project, um, I do all types of organizational work to reduce the cognitive effort on my part. One example is if you look at the top, I don't just have rehearsal markers, I also marked in who has the melody, what type of part of the song this is. Is this a violin solo? Sounds like a violin solo to me, let's label that. That way, when I potentially give this Reaper project to that person in Texas to record, they can know with as little effort as possible where they need to put their, their solo, and that makes it less effort for you when you need to correct them maybe because they recorded over your sax solo, right? Um, it means doing things like um, figuring out uh, what they need in terms of information. Maybe they need guitar tabs. Maybe they need um, not guitar tabs. They read actual legitimate music and not tabs for some reason. Maybe they're a flute player and they need it in C. Maybe they're an alto sax player and they need it in E flat. The more of that type of work you can do and just have it be done, don't even like make them ask for it, it's just gonna make things more efficient uh, because you're probably gonna end up needing to do that stuff anyways, right? Just now you get to do it on a time crunch, et cetera. Just do it, you know, it, 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 it's, it makes friends and it's more efficient. Um, kind of the corollary to setting deadlines for yourself, you need to also plan on time for uh, learning new skills. So if your band releases music once a month, and you decide one day that you're gonna stop using addictive drums and you're gonna use superior drummer, maybe you're not releasing a song that month. Maybe you're, that's your learn superior drummer month, right? I'm not saying that because that's exactly what happened to me last month, but that's exactly what happened to me that last month, right? Like, it's, everybody needs to do it. You need to learn new skills to, to actually improve, plan for that downtime. Um, and then other things, um, when you're working with remote players, like if you're working with someone who's in Texas, um, you need to uh, consider things like uh, sending them the Reaper project so that um, they uh, so that they don't need to. Uh... I had a good trade of thought for this bullet point. I forgot what it was. I'm way over time. We move around. It's it, like when you're working with remote players. There's a lot of things that come up that don't come up when you're just in the same room with them. Um, that stuff gets in the way a lot. Consider it. Uh, maybe go to a better panel where the guy remembers what those things are. Um, but I was really hoping to have some time for Q&A. We're well past when I wanted to end this. Uh, but hopefully that was helpful for you guys. I'm happy to take any questions. There's no mic, so unfortunately, uh, this probably won't show up in the recorded video. Uh, but uh, just go ahead and raise your hands and shut them out. Otherwise, uh, uh, feel free to get out of here and go into the rest of the con. What's up? Uh, can you bring up your, or do you mind if you bring up that, that, that Thing. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, there's no secrets there. I, uh, there's, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so what, what, are, what, are that, what are those, what are these things over here on the right? Uh, all this stuff down here? Are those the effects and stuff? So, yeah, um, this is getting a little bit more into Reaper specific workflow, uh, but those are additional tracks, right? And uh, everything that's down here um, typically has an equivalent up here. Reaper lets you hide some things from each view. Um, so what's down here um, are a track that I set up exclusively for the contact uh, plugin, a track that I set up exclusively for my uh, uh, analog synthesizer, addictive keys, addictive drums, and addictive percussion. Addictive percussion is what's producing. Uh, um, so what's the difference between the addictive percussion and the perk thing that you have there? 
Purpose. Sorry, we're using perp. This? Okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah so we're getting into very specific workflows of me, but just to answer the question, so I like to have all my audio tracks, uh, let's get rid of all this. Uh, no, this is never, okay. I like to have all my audio tracks grouped up here, and let's see if we can get rid of the music track. Yeah. All my audio tracks grouped up here, and then a single folder containing all my MIDI tracks, so that I can then say, uh, 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 oh, I need to get back to it. Now say something like, I want to hear a tape where there's no mini instruments. So that's a useful grouping for me. And then a lot of these so just grouping a different. Yes, yes. Uh, but now you'll notice that down here, uh, all that stuff on the far right is not there. Um, so I have a, these tracks set up um, separate. Um, and the reason for that is because then I can set up a routing system where um, if I attach, for example, uh, addictive keys straight to my piano audio track, then let's say we get a keyboardist and they record like an actual piano, and I want to replace that MIDI with actual audio data, they'll clash with each other, right? But now I can just mute the MIDI track down here, uh, mute, the, mute the MIDI piano down here, um, and this is a so if I want to put a real piano audio in here, I can. Um, now, that gets into the concept of routing, which is pretty universal because you want to move audio from one track to another, move MIDI data from one track to another, um, but different DAWs will call it different things. But the idea is I, I have the MIDI data starts here, and it gets sent not straight to a plugin that's on the same track. It gets sent to a different track where um, for example, this track has the contact plugin on it, and it actually has uh, two different instruments set up. It has my, uh, one of my analog synths, and it has my uh, uh, like the percussion shaker yeah. sounding sort of thing. Um, so I don't have to have different eight different contact players open, taking a lot of RAM. I just send all the MIDI data into there, yeah, tell contact what to do with those, tell contact then send the piano data here, send the shaker data there, okay. etc. Uh, so that's the workflow that I've established. There's a lot of different ways to do similar things like that. Um, but again, the key thing is, I did this once, saved the template of it, I don't even remember how to do it anymore. I just don't, I just don't do it, you know? I make incremental changes when I need to. If we add a kazoo player, we'll have to add a new track for them. But, I mean, that's usually not how bands work. So. Uh, any other questions? What's up? Uh, I'm a guitar player, I'm trying to do, like, when I get into doing, like, Guitar playthroughs of like some metal songs I like. Yeah. And um, I guess I'm having like, I don't know it's like latency problems, but I guess trying to run like an amp stand with a tab I are yeah. is like adding a lot to that. I can't, like, I want to be able to hear the track while I'm playing, but also hear my guitar with distortion. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if there's a way I can like split my drive signal like going into the audio interface and like also to just like my amp in my room so that way I can hear myself but still pick up a DI. Yeah. I don't know like is there a good, can you s split it like that with that type of interface? It depends, it depends on the, so it, it depends a lot on what hardware you have, right? So um, for this interface right here, um, there is what we call hardware monitoring where you can plug a headphones right into the front of this, and uh, it was, so as opposed to plugging into your laptop um, or uh, plugging into your speakers, you plug your headphones straight into here, and um, anything that goes into the, if this feature is enabled, anything that goes into it, um, presumably from a microphone or a guitar input, will go directly through an electrical like circuit straight out to headphones again. That sounds like the type of thing that you want. Uh, not every interface has that, uh, but th they really should. Yeah, mine does, but then I'm only getting like my dry signals. Yeah. I kind of want to like feel like, you know, yeah. some distortion and feedback so I know what I'm doing. Right, so th that goes into like, obviously that's not good enough for you, right? Otherwise you would have just been doing that because probably your interface has that. Um, that's kind of the drawback of that, is if you're doing that approach, then you need to be applying your effects in hardware. So that's not great. Um, 
Unfortunately, the right to answer your question depends heavily on specifics of what you have, what operating system you're running, what uh, what uh, computer you're running, what interface you're running. Um, the biggest, most general tips I can give you are definitely make sure you're running ASIO. Are you running? Are you using Reaper? Yeah, I'm actually running like almost exactly the same setup. Yeah, I have a slightly different kind of interface, but it's the same type of model. Cool. Um, yeah, Reaper. PC. Yeah, so you definitely uh, almost certainly. Uh, have already set up ASIO. That's a thing to check. Um, no, that's just the plugins are just very. Complicated. The thing is that that's not the most likely thing ever, right? Unless it's very specific configuration of that plugin. Because plugins can do that. I'll give you an example of one plugin that does do that is uh, Reaper's built in auto tune. So uh, Reaper's built in auto tune, if you enable it, um, will actually add a, a significant amount of latency. And the way that you can see that in Reaper, it, again, this is very DOS specific, but I know how to do it in Reaper. If you look at the bottom left, um, it'll tell you how much CPU usage is being uh, incurred by the plugins you have, and also how much latency is added. So none of these, VEQ, Recomp, Reverbate, Redelay, uh, Retune with the Auto-Tune actually disabled, none of that actually adds a single sample latency, so that's good. Um, but adding automatic pitch, pitch correction, it's gotta listen to a full 9,000 samples of music before it decides what note that was. And that 9,000 samples at 48,000 samples per second, that's like a fifth of a second, All right? So I, I would say the <coughs> first step to solving this problem um, is you wanna isolate if it's one of your plugins. And the way to do that is to just go in, enable and disable each of them, and see if any of them change this number. If that happens, you found your culprit, and maybe try to find a, find a different plugin that does the same thing. That's not always avoidable with guitar effects, because a lot of those work by just taking a chunk of audio and doing some processing with it. There's no way around that for some of them. But that's, I, I think, the, the way to go, is if, you're, if your hardware setup is as similar as it is to mine, and you've got ASIO going, um, unless your, your sample block size is really large, Probably not, because it defaults to pretty small. Unless that's the case, it's one of your plugins, and you're gonna have to figure out which one it is. Okay. Yeah. Does right like running other programs in the background increase latency? Um, no. Uh, gee, I, I, I mean, nothing's impossible. I would expect running programs in the background to create crackling, right? Because you just continue, you create a, a contention for the CPU time, and what that's gonna generally result in is it's just not gonna produce the audio fast enough to fill that buffer. Um, and that's, I think, much more likely than it just delaying the audio altogether. Now, not that it's possible. I don't know how your interface works. I don't have it in the hand, right? But I, I, I don't think that's likely. Um, it's worth trying, but like once you've ruled everything out, so. Uh, anything else? Here for you guys. What's up? Do you have any experience working with the uh, different hardware? Uh, uh, did you say Ardor and what? Ardor. Just Ardor. Um, yes, I'm a heavy Linux user. Um, I really, uh, I'm really excited at the idea of being able to do this in Linux because uh, Windows is not the best, right? Um, the last time I tried Ardor, I had no experience with music production. Uh, so I couldn't tell you based off that experience if it's any good or not. Uh, it is, uh, part of the reason that I recommend Reaper is because the community around it is so huge that like, you can type literally any phrase followed by the words in Reaper, and you'll get so much documentation on how to do it. That's not true for Ardor, right? Uh, just because there's so many nested levels of nerdhood you need to subscribe to in order to be the guy that uses Ardor. Um, so, because of that, for someone who's starting out, I wouldn't recommend Ardor. Um, the thing that kind of, that I had a lot of trouble with when I used Ardor was um, the Jack audio system. So kind of Linux is equivalent of ASIO. And uh, I didn't have an experience fixing stuff in Jack to be able to make anything work together. And so that just made me get really frustrated and quit. And so that brings me back to like my second slide, which is like, you just need to, Whatever buttons you need to click to re reduce the possibility of that happening, you need. You should. I recommend you do that. And Reaper falls into that category. Now, two things to say. One, I could probably try Ardor again, 
and it'll probably be fine. The problem that you're gonna run into is that VSTs in, are a highly useful thing, right? Or maybe not for you. Maybe you're not gonna do any of this MIDI stuff. Maybe you're not gonna do any effect. You're just recording acoustic guitar and that's it, right? But generally speaking, VSTs are highly useful and those generally have to be uh, compiled for the operating system in question. So there's Mac versions and Windows versions. So generally speaking, if you are going to try to use a VST in Linux, you're gonna be doing it through Wine. If you're asking this question, I'm sure you know where the rest of the sentence is going. Actually, no, because I, I've been using it in Windows. Oh. And I've been writing to it kind of problems. Okay. And I've been doing a lot of work around. Oh, okay. Right. So, I just made myself look like a fool. I didn't really know uh, Ardor supported Windows. It, it, I, when I read it, it just recently started supporting Windows. Okay, so that's brand new stuff. Okay. I'm not that dumb. Good. Um, if that's the case, you're probably going to sidestep that problem. Uh, Ardor itself, I can't speak on the quality of the product. Okay. Right? Um, one thing, now that we've gone down this rabbit hole that does bear mentioning, Reaper does support Linux now. Uh, which is really cool. I haven't tried it yet, um, but like I said, I'm super excited to give it a try. Um, and apparently they even did some of the work um, to help make VSTs work. And by that, I mean wine. Uh, so you still run into that problem, but uh, free software options for um, music production are getting better. Uh, but it's just like Steam for Linux, right? Like, it's getting better, but not as fast as video games are getting better, right? So um, definitely give our door a shot, but not at first. You know, I think I think stick to easy mode. And if your objection is the uh, the cost, like I said, Reaper is free for evaluation purposes. It's just going to nag you until you pay for it. Until, once you start actually putting out music, please do pay for it. But I would say if you get to the point where you're uh, putting music out and uh, like actually understand enough of the stuff that we talked about today to be productive, maybe try our door then. You know, maybe then you'll be able to map some of those concepts to what Ardor, how Ardor works, and you'll know how the VSTs work, so it's not going to be all black box. Worth a shot then. I uh, Reaper is 60 bucks and you get the whole thing. There's, what is that? Reaper is zero bucks and you get the whole thing. There's no limitation whatsoever other than that, right? So that's why I'm saying like, <clears throat> 60 bucks is not a lot to ask. Like, this is a world class tool. Um, I, I've yet to hear someone like name a feature that like Logic has that this doesn't have some equivalent of, right? And also, there's maybe a thousand Logic users. There's a billion Reaper users because Reaper is sixty bucks and Logic is a mortgage, right? So Reaper is really great for learning um, because there's just so little investment, right? Um, but yeah, when you do buy it, so they, they have like a pro tier license that's like. 200 bucks, still way less than everybody else. And they really want you to buy that if you're like making more than $25,000 a year on your music. Come on, right? Who's making that much money on their music? Not me. I just got my first, uh, no, not, uh, I've been getting uh, quarterly checks from uh, from Spotify for my like three songs on Spotify for a year, and it's like 10 bucks. So uh, I think I'm sticking with the $60 here for a while. Uh, you had a question over here. Uh, I wanted to know what type of mics you recommend for recording instruments. Yeah, so um, I can give you two recommendations. Uh, one is the one that I did at the entry level, AT2020. You cannot go wrong with that, right? Um, once I started to feel like, you know, let's check out what else is out there, um, I got what's called the Yeti Bluebird. Uh, and I'm gonna, I'm just gonna pull the I got that because that's what it's saying the right uses. Uh, so I thought, how bad could it be? It's amazing. It's just, it, it made me sound a, a lot better. And I feel like that's just because it, but well, generally speaking, there's two characteristics that any microphone is gonna have. One is its frequency response, kind of like with the Beats by Dr. Dre conversation, but in reverse, right? So like it happens to prefer certain frequencies um, and the Yeti Bluebird just happens to prefer certain frequencies that make saxophone sound good. Two, the second uh, characteristic is the pattern of which uh, like the audio enters micro. Um, so this is a, a couple of different types, but generally speaking, they'll, they'll, they'll be like highly directional microphones, they'll be like omnidirectional microphones, there'll be microphones where like, it'll have like a, a light bulb shape, where like it'll get, uh, it'll get some of the audio that's around here, 
and more of the audio that's here, and more of the audio that's here, um, but nothing back here, right? Um, this isn't one of those. This, you gotta speak straight into it to really get the meat and bones of it, right? So that's super annoying for, uh, for a saxophone. Um, so those are the two microphones that I have extensive experience with. Um, the what microphone to recommend conversation is a difficult one for a lot of people to have because unless you're like super into gear and are a full-time musician, you probably haven't used that many microphones. So you don't really have that many points of comparison and you're mostly just going off of what other people tell you and the results you've had with your own hardware. So I don't feel too comfortable re recommending stuff other than what I've used. Um, and also it depends on what instrument that you're looking for. Like what, what, what are you looking to record? Uh, I wanted to find up a couple of guitar caps or maybe some drums. Yeah, so get to, uh, that's another example. It's, it's way different. Something like, uh, I believe it's a Shure SM57. Something like this, very commonly used for that type of thing, I believe. Uh, but they also make micro uh, microphones that are specifically marketed for guitar caps. And you know, those again, I'm gonna have a, 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 like a directional pattern that's highly useful for not a saxophone player, right? Um, I would say um, that's a conversation that you should have with people that are playing the instruments that you want to play uh, at a high level. Um, and MacTrust, I think, is a great place to do that. So definitely like hop around the jam clinic and like uh, talk to like the guitarists uh, that, that are on staff, uh, get their recommendations. Because uh, uh, I'm going to be honest with you, I don't play guitar, so I can't answer that question for you very well. But it's a good question. It's just one that you want to have like uh, a little bit more on a one-on-one -on -one basis with people. Yeah. Uh, anything else I can answer for you guys? Awesome. Uh, thank you guys so much for coming out. Uh, this is a lot of fun. Thank you so much. Uh, this is a lot of fun for me to do. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. Um, if you do, uh, let Kevin know. We'll, we'll try to put more stuff together. Uh, maybe we'll do deeper dives into some of this stuff next year. Um, you know, this whole jam shop thing is a new thing for uh, MacFest this year. Uh, kind of an offshoot of the jam clinic. We're really trying to see what people want. So, uh, you know, uh, let us know what you, what you want and we'll try to make it happen. So again, thanks for coming out and uh, I'll see you guys around, around the gym tonight. Thank you.